turn God bolts if anybody's got a dog. Um, I think this is the third time for me demonstrating in front of this group. And um, I found it a fairly uh, nice group compared to the Denver group. They're a little nasty. So <laughs> I always feel a little better here. Um, tonight I'm, I'm going to uh, talk about and, and demonstrate a, a threading jig. And uh, I got interested in cutting threads quite some time ago and um, looked at a lot of people hand chasing threads. And uh, I, I just looked at that and, and I said, I've got to find a way that I can do it quickly and repeatedly. And, and I ran into some threading jigs. The first threading jig I saw years ago was a Barney Klein jig. And she makes a really, or she did make a really high quality small threading jig that fit on one of her small lays. You'd have to build an adapter to fit. And I wanted something like that. Um, and I looked around and looked around and finally ran into this Baxter threading jig a couple years ago. I think the first place I saw it was at the Loveland Symposium. And finally uh, bit and bought one. And uh, uh, now I've got two for a couple different size lathes and I've got an adapter. So I've got um, a fair amount of investment into it. But what we're gonna do is, is walk through uh, the majority of the uh, process in turning a elk horn box and then cutting the threads in the elk horn and the base and top are gonna to be Corian. So uh, that's uh, the demonstration and I'm really gonna focus on the thread cutting more than anything. I did a box, an antler box here a couple of years ago with a press lid fit and I did a lot of talking about that um, I'll repeat some of it, but I'm going to really condense it on the thread cutting because I think that's what the most of the people that are here want to see. Um, and hopefully we'll uh, uh, get what you want to want to see. Uh, when cutting elk antler um, or turning elk antler, I get elk antler um, at the Jackson Boy Scout elk antler auction that is the third weekend in May. And uh, they sell, the Boy Scouts pick up elk campers off the refuge, have an auction up there, and they also have private sellers that sell bits and pieces of antlers, and that's who I deal with because I'm looking just at the, at the main beam of the antler as it comes off the head. It's the biggest and it's the roundest piece, and that's the only piece I'm looking for. Um, you can, uh, from the outside, before they're cut, they all look good, but there's a little difference in how thick the wall is, et cetera, on the elk antler, and I'll kind of walk through that. Um, if you can zero in, I'm going to talk first on this piece right here. And this may not show up real good. It, it, it doesn't, but the elk antler essentially it's got a core that is, um, that is very porous. It's almost like capillary tubes or hair. And uh, then it, that will be very diameter and it will go out towards the edge and there will be a solid white border around that before you get to the dark bark on the outside of the antler. And what you want is as large a mamper as you can get, but the bigger they are, the harder they are, they are to find. And you want them as round as possible. And then you want that white border between the bark and that porous section to be as thick as you can get it. Because that is going to be the section where your threads are cut into. And if you have to cut into this porous stuff, um, it, it cuts okay, but the, the threads seem to be kind of rough and um, they, ju they just don't do as well. I'm gonna pass some pieces around. When they get to the back, if you just wanna hold them in the back someplace and I'll get them at the end. Um, this is a great looking round piece of antler, but it's a pretty poor piece because that white part is so thin. So this is one I would not be happy with, Harry. You can put out. There's a couple of more pieces here that are just slices. Um, I will send those. They have a thicker 
white border, and I'm, I would be happy with them. And that's where your uh, threads are going to cut into. You can see it there. So as you get these as round as you can get them, you've got a better chance of getting a perfect circle in there and getting teeth cut into that white portion all the way around. So here's a couple of much better pieces. Um, and what I do is I find a piece of antler and cut it. This one's um, quite white on the outside. I like a darker antler, but it's um, fairly round and it's got a fairly thick white spot. And before I start turning that, I need something to thicken up and strengthen up that porous part in the middle because that is going to become a tenon that I'm going to hold in a small chuck. Uh, if you don't do anything with it, that stuff will just crush. Some people say, if you look at the size of that antler, that would just about fit in a 50 millimeter jaw of a, of a chuck, and why not just put it in there and cinch it down? If you do that, the chuck determines the center of your piece and not you. And then you get into problems with where the threads end up and they end up in the wrong part of the antler. So you want to pick the center of that antler. So what I do when I am start one of these, and I'll just do a quick, is, I'm going to be on this one right here, is I simply take thick CA glue, put it on a piece of wax paper because uh, the, the CA glue sometimes will go right through the antler and then it'll glue the antler to whatever, you know, like your dining room table. Or, <laughs> I don't do mine on a dining room table anymore. But I just take CA glue, and cover the top end of it with a fairly thick and that's it and then I let that sit and it'll run down in there and it'll harden and I usually wait a day or two flip it over do the same thing on the other side and then put it away for a week or two before I turn it this stuff, if it's not pretty flat, it'll start running off the edge. And if you get the super glue on the outside of the bark and you want to keep that bark, uh, it's going to look kind of funny. So um, I'm going to put this over on the table and try to get it level. But that's essentially the preparation <coughs> for making that porous part tough enough to make a tenon out of it. And then when I've got, this one's glued, both ends. When I've got that dry, I've got a series of small discs that are roughly various eight inch increments and roughly the size of that piece. That is just a hair pig. And I will center those. Is that in a show? Where that red spot is a, is a center. And I just move that around to kind of see where the center of that piece is best so I can get the threads to fill into that white, thicker part on the edge. And when I do that, I put an awl in and mark a center spot with it, both ends, and then turn that between centers and put a tenon on one edge. Kind of determine, looking at it, which is going to be the best for the top and the bottom. And you kind of get a feeling for that after you've turned a few. Um, and that's kind of it. Yeah, Doug? What do you use for a center? Do you use a fork, fork spur or a step? I use a, a step center. Okay. So it's the small half inch ones. And uh, they seem to work just fine for that. Um, I will put it between centers and uh, cut a tenon to fit a small one of these uh, apprentice uh, chucks and you can get these from Bulldog or you can get them from Craft Supply. I really like them, they're a small chuck 
They've got like five or six sets of jaws that come with them, and they're about, um, they're under $150. But uh, for turning something like this elk handler where you've got a, a small tenon and you don't want the chuck to be way bigger than your piece, these are ideal. So I've cut the antler on the bandsaw, try to get the two sides relatively parallel to each other and perpendicular to the line of the antler, but the antler is kind of a, a crazy shape. Turn the center and put a uh, tenon on one end and then mount it in a chuck. Then what I do is I will have the chuck and I'm going to skip these parts because I want to get to the um, uh, thread cutting. Hold it in the headstock, turn the outside until it is kind of the way I want it. And if you've looked at those elk antler boxes up there, there's some with all the bark on them. There's one with a red and blue piece of corian on it where all the bark is turned off and then there's other ones that are kind of a mixture. And there's no right or wrong, you just start turning and stopping and look to see how it comes out. I kind of like the ones with a little bark and I like the ones with all the bark on them. And I think that in order to tell that it's elk antler, you gotta leave a little of the bark. So, but once you get the outside turned and you can, I, I, you're strictly cutting that with a, while it's in the um, uh, chuck, with a um, spindle roughing gouge and turn it fairly fast, uh, kind of like a piece of wood about that size. I mean, you can turn it pretty fast. And once I get it to the shape I want it, then I figure out how far I chew up the outside edge and figure out how far deep I can drill a hole into it uh, and still be able to part it off and drill that hole with horseman bits, slowing the lathe way down just like you'd be drilling in grain on a piece of wood and leaving whatever thickness is going to be enough to put threads in and also the contours of the bark to make sure you've got enough there to, to have a stable box so it, there's no right or wrong there's no real thin way to do it some of those uh, the biggest roundest one is fairly thick there because the indentions from the bark are so deep that you just can't get it very thin and then I take and sand it with sandpaper up to about a thousand and then take inside and out and then take micro mesh and take it to about 15,000 with micro mesh. Dry sanding. I don't wet sand it. Uh, I don't have anything against uh, the process of wet sanding. I just, there's something about getting my lathe wet that I'm not too crazy about, so I, I, um, I try not to do that. Um, then you mount the piece that's been sanded and hollowed or, or um, drilled on the threading jig and put your cutter in the headstock. Bear with me, I'm gonna, I'll get these off and then back this up. And the, the um, cutter is just a collet with a drawbar, and this one is a, um, sold by the same company, but a number of people sell these uh, cutters. They're carbide, um, the cutters themselves are probably about $50 a piece, but they will cut a lot of boxes as long as you don't drop them. And simply put it in the headstock, put some spacers and washers on it so I can get a nut on it and draw it up tight. And just put that drop bar in so we don't have to worry about 
cutter coming out. Anytime you're putting lateral pressure and vibration on a Morse taper in a headstock, it's probably going to come out. Um, they, they say if it's a perfect taper, clean, that won't come out, but Boy, when and you turn this thing, you're cutting at about 3,000 RPM. You don't want to try to catch that when, when it's going 3,000 RPM. It's just going to rip the devil out of you. The Thread Master, this one, um, and if you're looking for it, uh, you just look up Baxter Threading Jig. I have no relationship with Baxter Threading Jig other than I really like their product. And this particular one was built for my uh, robust lathe which has got a two inch shorter throw on it than the Powermatic, but most of the clubs that you, I demonstrate for have Powermatic lathes. So I bought an adapter from the same guy to fit this to bring it up a couple inches. The Threadmaster itself, um, you're probably looking at um, $500 for it and you determine, you give him the exact specs of your lathe and he will build it for your lathe. You decide how big of, of y-axis you've got, how big of threads you want to cut on a piece. Um, the bigger the pieces, obviously, the more money it costs. And then you pick the threads per inch that you want. This is a 16 threads per inch machine and uh, he builds it for you. He has nothing in stock. So if you want to order something from him, you, you got to be prepared to be waiting probably two to three months for it. And I find out he's a little on the slow end of delivery, but give yourself plenty of time because the machine is worth, worth the wait. It's really a, a great machine. So when you're doing these, um, the, the, the oh, I got to refer back to a story, but I'll make a transition. The, the Alcantara takes good threads, and the Corian um, takes wonderful threads as well. And I'll tell you a little bit about, I told you where to get the Alcantara. The Corian um, <coughs> bathroom and kitchen shops uh, have Corian, and uh, you need to make a relationship with one of those shops. And the sink cutouts that they have, etc., they end up in a scrap pile. For the most part, they don't use those. And if you develop a relationship with that person in the shop, um, they will save pieces for you. Uh, I was at my 50th high school reunion last year in Billings, Montana, and I know I don't look anywhere near that old. But, um, geez, uh, other people at that reunion were really old. <laughs> um, found one of my classmates, and lo and behold, he has the Corian shop business in Billings. And, uh, <laughs> was a great renewal of our relationship. I called him or sent him an email a couple months ago and I said, I'm coming up in a few months. Can you set some dark pieces away from me? Because the light Corian is easy to get, the dark stuff is hard to find. People don't put in sinks and, and countertops of the, of the dark and they've got some fabulous dark kinds. And I told him about 10 different patterns that I wanted. And my brother went over to a shop and just picked it up. He said there was about 300 pounds of Corian and it was, none of it was sink cutouts. It was all cut off new pieces that he got for me. So um, not everybody's going to have a friend that's got one of those shops. The key to it is if you go there and get something from the guy, make a box for him and take it back and give it to him. And it buys a friendship that just uh, will always stay there. So I've got a couple places in Denver where I, I try to find it, but this one in Billings is now where I get most of my Corian. I get a big stock of it and go from there. And it comes in every color in the, in the world. Any questions on? Okay. Um, the, the beauty of the of this threading jig and the Bonnie Klein one is you can, since they're running the, uh, between the ways, you can get back to the same position each and every time with a, with a stop if you put it in. So I've got the cutter in and it's placed. I bring the heads, the 
tail or the uh, threading jig up and bring it until the cutting edge is right even with the edge of the box. And that's where I want to stop it. And they've got a little stop that again fits into your between your ways that will clamp down. And you need to get that on there and tightened up because that's going to determine where that piece comes to a stop each time. When you turn the threads, you pull it back out, you fit the box, you put it back up, you want it to go to the exact same position. So your threads start at the same place and that's a key. And the other type of threading jigs that I've seen that fit in a banjo or whatever, they don't go back to the same place. You get a good thread the first time you pull it out, you go to make fit your box, you need to cut a little more off, and now you're turning a tapered thread. So you've got to have some place to get it, the X and Y axis exactly where they were before. So you get this set down, and like I say, this one is at 16 threads per inch. Um, and you just bring it over so it's just going to touch the inside wall of that and this knob feeds the threading jig into the cutter at 16 threads per inch it's designed that way and you can get this top head, a different head for it for eight threads per inch or whatever you want to do. Everything you add on is just more money. So, <laughs> so when you're turning, when you're cutting this, you start to lathe. Everything's the headstock is secured down. This is secured. This is out of the way. The faster you cut turn the um, cutter, the better thread you're going to get. So, this is up to 3,000 RPM, which usually makes a pretty good thread. And, up against this, and you just start, what I do, is I get a focal point here, There's a set screw in this piece here. I'm just going to count how many times that goes in. And I'm going to put three threads in the female portion of that cut. So I'll go three re revolutions in, back it out, feed the cutter in a little bit more, and just repeat that. So. Three threads. back out. And then I feed this at 100 got to make sure this is out. A hundredth of an inch each time. And then do it again. And you should be able to get if it's perfectly centered and it just touching the first time, you, you should be able to do that in about time. Um, uh, you know, 70 thousandths and get a thread there. So I've, I've gone in hundreds and just repeat it again. I have no relief cut on this portion so I can't feed it in and cut both directions and you and you cut. Does that make sense? I don't want to just jam the box into the thread cutter without another When I first started doing this, if you if you started out spindle turning and you made a mallet.
and somebody gave you one of those KC wire burners, and you put a burn mark in that mallet, and then you sanded it off, and you stopped the lathe, and you looked at that, and you went, man, that is cool. It's perfectly straight. I'm going to do another one. So you do another one. And, and so when you get the mallet done, it's got like a hundred of those burn lines in it. It's not like Doug's. <laughs> but, you know, it, 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 there's too much. But it's, there's so much fun when you first start turning. And then you realize as you do a piece like that, maybe three lines or something is probably all you need to make it pretty. When you're doing the boxes, these threads are so much fun. It's, it's kind of neat to put a whole bunch of threads in, but you really only want a couple threads to hold that lid on because you can't, you know, if, if you're, it, it just doesn't work. So about three threads is all you really need to put in a, a box. got a peak at the top of it that the thread is not flat um, and I think one more and we should be pretty close um, you can also turn left-handed threads with these you got to get a different top that feeds instead of right-handed it feeds left-handed um, so you can, and people ask me, there's a left-handed thread box up there. Why a left-handed thread? And I don't have the answer to that other than it's, it's pretty cool to have a left-handed thread. There's a, an example right here. Um, this is a left-handed thread. And um, it, it, no matter how many of these you see and how many, it, it even, confuses me on trying to turn it on the lathe because you're always doing things the wrong way. But um, if you don't warn people that that lid is on there so tight you'll never get it off. So it's left-handed and um, be aware of that. But you can do that as well. And I don't, you know, unless it was uh, like your uh, pedals on a bicycle where the one is right-handed and one is left-handed so they don't spin out as you're going, I can't think of a really good reason for it. I'm going to put one more thread in there and then talk just a little bit more about a couple things I didn't mention. Instructions that come with the Baxter machine just talk about threading a, a box and they're not real good instructions. They just kind of say, bring this up till it touches, go in a certain amount and just cut them all in one swoop. And um, I had a couple people that said that they were having trouble and once I showed them to do it a little bit at a time, their, their threads improved greatly. <coughs> but, um, when, when you, uh, what was it, Adam Luna? Was he the one that did the thread chasing here? Watched him, and uh, I know a number of people that chase threads. Adam does it, and uh, the guy out of um, Wyoming, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he does them. Um, Kirk DeHere does them. Uh, I have great admiration for the skill in cutting those, but um, I, I just have no 
interest in hand chasing threads, especially when they make something this beautiful to do. <laughs> so we have got these cut, and um, I'm not going to pass this around, but the, the threads are identical to ones. I would put that back in the headstock and just touch this up a little bit with um, uh, either uh, just a sandpaper, maybe 400, something to, to make sure it's clean. Uh, if there's much of an edge on it, I may take a, a spindle gouge and just get a nice clean cut on it. And um, other than once this is ready, I would part it off back here almost, you know, to where the bottom is, put it on a wooden jam chuck and chew up that edge again. You want the bottom edge of this to be absolutely perpendicular so that when it, since it's an odd size around it, when it sets on the base, you don't see any highs or low spots. That makes sense? Okay. Um, when, when I'm doing that, these, these are obviously cut to whatever size uh, Forstner bits I've got. And this one was, I had a lid one, one and seven sixteenths, whatever it was. And you just, I've got quite a few of them, and you go until you think you're as thin as you can, but the integrity of the box is going to be. Mess up your camera. What do you think of that? Be <clears throat> then I would take the top, and it, this has got a different thread on it. So I'm going to change the spindle out on this. That small chuck is a one by eight, and um, this all this other stuff is an inch and an eight inch and a quarter by eight. Uh, you try not to use many adapters, as few adapters as you can, so you, you run out, you, you keep it at a minimum, because the further you get off of everything, obviously you got problems with that. But when I take this, when I get to this point, I will take a caliper, so you, you only need to make some Rough calculations. You, there, there's, this is machine work, but I would just take this and set these calipers a little bigger than the deepest part of that thread. And then I would transfer that to a piece of Corian and turn the Corian round to that rough diameter. And I've eliminated a lot of these to try to get through this. This is strictly a face plate with a piece of Corian that has been drilled and tapped, which is easy to do, to fit these screws, um, or nuts, or bolts, I should say. And then a second piece glued on, and then I just glue them on and true them up, and glue them on and true them up. <coughs> use that as a waste block um, to avoid having a tenon, all of those kinds of issues. And I, I turn the circles of Corian first on a bandsaw, then glue them on this with CA glue, let them set 24 hours. Uh, it's probably, you could probably cut them before then. Um, but this is going to be the male portion of that and once we get the threads cut in this we will part it off and then I'll make a jam chuck with threads to hold that to finish the outside of it, the bottom of it or the top of it. So we go through the same routine again of getting this to the outside of it 
and lined up so it's just about at the edge. This one I'm going to put threads on all the way on it so I'm, I'm not worried about a point where I've got to count three threads or four threads. I'm going to put threads on it all the way on it, fix it, uh, <coughs> fit it to the box, and then when I'm done, cut some of those threads away so I just have the threads in the box and on the lid matching. There's no threads really sticking out and then build the top from there. So same thing, you got to have a reference point to bring it back up to each and every time because if you are cutting 16 threads per inch and you don't have it lined up and you move it and it's a half a thread off, you've got 32 threads per inch and then they don't fit. So same thing except this one you've got to think a little bit about because the way this is set up, since this is a male thread, when you feed this into the thread cutter, the thread cutter has a tendency to want to take and pull this off these threads. It's going the wrong way. Does that make sense? And you say, well, all you got to do is move this over and cut on the other side, but you've changed both of them. So it's still doing the same thing. When you're cutting the female thread, the cutter is forcing the faceplate onto this. When you're cutting the male thread, it's, it's wanting to face it off. So I just take a wrench and I got that double spacer. Just get it as tight as you can. Put it on and go through the same drill, but this time I can cut a thread one way since there's a relief in it, then feed the cutter a little bit, cut it back and go both ways. With the female thread, there was no relief on the inside of that, so I can't get to it, so. Same thing, same speed, but this time I hold this to make sure that I'm not gonna get any backlash or whatever, you, you don't want it. The first thread, maybe if it's hot, you'd be all right because you've got enough material to go, but when you're towards the end, if you goof it up, you've got to start over again. And you don't want to get your hand near that cutter. And I'm not speaking from experience. Well, you're cutting both directions. Yeah. You know, when you think about it, the, the cutter's going 3,000 RPM. Um, you're feeding this in at 5 RPM. Um, the cutter's doing the cutting, and it really has no impact on which direction you're going. And this is one when you... You turn this down to roughly the diameter size that you cut the threads for a bit and then you back it off and fit the box lid to see if it fits. And then cut a little bit more and do it again. Um, so there's, there's no micrometer work or anything like that. It's
There's a lot of wood. And I'll just test it this. There's a lot of woods that will take pretty good prints. Um, boxwood, English boxwood, those, those are make superb prints, but that's hard to find wood and it's expensive. Um, hard maple, uh, lignin vitae, um, there's, there's quite a few different woods that will take a, take a you know, good, they're usually hard, tight grain. Um, <coughs> Cottonwood, aspen, soft maple, um, not so good. But uh, I have had more experience with the Corian and this, and that's still too big. So it's and that's all there is on on measuring this thing. There's no scientific. This is unlike if you're trying to, if you got a piece of nice figured wood and you're trying to get a top, that's almost there, and a bottom and the, and the grain to match, you got to do both pieces perfectly the first time. With a piece of elk antler and a corian for the lid, you can goof it up and go back to the corian pile and start over, and, and your box is not. Not ruined. That was very close, so I'm just going to cut one time, back it out. lubrication in a bit, but that thread I'm happy with on how it fits. We're going to do a little more clean it up and uh, get this off and do some cutting and show you how to finish it off and then we'll make a jam chuck. And Good place to be for me. Uh, yeah, probably. Yeah. Other side. Um, stay right there. Okay. Okay. The cutter doesn't. Um, the cutter really doesn't get very hot, but I'm not taking much material off it one time. So, and when I'm cutting the uh, drilling the hole in the elk antler, I, I do the same thing with the um, Forstner bits. I start with about a inch bit, maybe three quarter inch bit, and then make the first cut as deep as you want to go. A box that size is 
two inches tall, so I cut it one and seven inches deep, and then I take that Forstner bit off and go up in a quarter inch increments and do a quarter inch bigger and a quarter inch bigger until I get to the diameter I want to. And I've got a lot of Forstner bits to the sixteenth of an inch in, in size. But the first, when, when you're cutting in grain with a Forstner bit, the, the one that gets the hottest is the one that's taking the bulk of the material out the first time. <laughs> so the least expensive Forstner bit to ruin is the smaller diameter one. So you, you do the hog work with the smaller diameter one and then do bits and pieces and the Forstner bit doesn't get as hot and um, you, you don't have a, a tendency to ru ruin those big Forstner bits by taking them out a little bit at a time and I know that's a little time consuming but it, it saves on Forstner bits and the big Forstner bits get kind of expensive. So I'll get this out of the way. Uh, I go all the way through, it's just a cylinder. Oh. They're right, look at oh, the, yeah. yeah, yeah. Gotcha. No, I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. great question. I haven't found a good way um, to hollow the boxes any other way. It, it, it's, it's tough material, and I wish Pam was here. Uh, she, uh, she did an L Handler box few years ago after I did a demo and, and it was one that was up on a roof that had been in the sun and weather for quite a while and she said it was so hard and uh, I had a piece of elk handler that I don't know where I got it but it showed that same weathering and I was turning it and it was brutal so you you want to find elk handler sheds that are pretty recent haven't been out in the weather as far as um, up on a roof where they bleached and, and got the elements because they will get rock hard. Uh, obviously, the elk antlers that you pick up in the forest, um, you got to get to them right away because if, if you don't, another person hunting them will, or the animals do, and they chew them up, they're gone. So, on on this, question, yeah. Yes, sanding it the same way to, um, you know, starting with 180, going up through the grits to maybe 1,000, and then going to the micro mesh, going to 15,000. And is there any concern about toxicity or anything with the elk? Um, uh, Kip Christensen says be careful of it. And um, that's one of the guys that, you know, I first started noticing turning the elk antler besides Pete. Uh, when I'm doing it at home, um, I've got a mask on. I just um, invested in one of the helmets with the batteries and it blows the air um, to uh, try to eliminate that. But yeah, when I'm doing it alone, I the Corian and the elk antler, I protect my lungs. You need to do that with anything. Yeah. So on this, um, I would slow it down, which I have. And I would just, maybe I, maybe you are at the wrong spot, I don't know if you can see that. Just clean the edge of this uh, thread up. sand this edge. This is going to be the bottom of the top. Make sense? Yep. It's going to be in the dark most of the time. Okay. And then, um, this is a little rough, and this is the only one you can get to. So a lot of times I will take sandpaper, um, maybe 300, 
and clean up. And this is 400, doesn't matter. Clean up these. Just a touch with a folded piece of, and then maybe go the other way if I can figure out how to do this. And get, just smooth that up a little bit more. One of my complaints about the uh, 35B is that you can put it in reverse without knowing what you're doing and then all of a sudden uh, you turn it on you can't tell, you know. Then you spin it and the thing comes off and you go, what? <laughs> so I've got this cleaned up, uh, no, no lubrication on them until I'm done. But test fit it again, <laughs> that's fine. I mean, it, it, it's kind of noisy but a little bit of lubrication will come off. And I'm going to cut, this is on all the way, I'm going to cut these threads off that are sticking out. Okay? And there's about four of them. And just do that with a uh, spindle or a beading parting tool. the left-handed thread on it. When, when you look at that lid and you got the knob on top, you can also turn that lid on upside down and put it in so the knob is in the inside of the box, whether it's right-handed or left-handed. And um, my buddies in the Denver club thought that's pretty cool, so they take a box that I've made and turn it upside down and put the lid on. You can't get the thing apart. So you finally have to get a lid that's two-part and it's got a stop on it. So that's what this is. And I've cut a notch out of it so you can see kind of how I build it. And this will go down and that top will stop on the box. You can't put it any other way. Um, so you want this white shoulder to rest on the top of the box. You don't want the threads holding it up. So that's how many threads you cut off. It adds another step in the lid, but once you get comfortable with turning the threads, you start modifying the box to, to make the lid better and look better, etc. So, you know, my advice is if you're gonna do this kind of thing, get the cutter, get used to it, get competent in turning the threads and then start modifying it so everything comes together and they get a little thinner and, all of that. So I would just take this again, see if I've got all of them. And I've got about a full thread that I need to cut off. And actually, that fit is a pretty good fit, so usually everything goes wrong when you're doing a demo. <laughs> And then I just make this, make sure that this tenon that I'm putting on it is straight as you can get it um, and parallel to the ways. So when I make a lid that's going to go on top of that, um, it's going to fit just right. Uh, sand this edge, maybe put a couple details in it. I've already drilled a quarter inch hole in it. 
just to save time. Then I would park this off. So we'll park this off. And um, back it up a little bit. I've got to until this lathe is new. And it's a it, um, much better lathe than the 3520B. I think they've got an improvement. So I parked this back off about where the seam is from the white waste block to the dark. I don't park this all the way off. If you drop this, uh, you put you put a chink in it, and it's you're done. So you can't fix that. So I just take and uh, cut it to where there's not much left, and take a Japanese saw and saw the rest of it off. At the but we'll make a jam chuck and clean that up and uh, comes out like a oh. Oh. well <laughs> yeah I dinged it but that's all right something's got to go wrong <laughs> Um, well, you, you probably could. Let's see what happens. <laughs> uh, I was going to show you how to make a jam chuck, and then how I reuse a jam chuck so I don't have to build a jam chuck every time. But you, you could. Uh, which way would you rather see it? Jam chuck. Okay. You're kind of a troublemaker, Bonnie. <laughs> um, the jam chucks. When you think about this, I drilled a 1 and 7 16 inch hole into it and then cut the threads. So I take a jam chuck made out of wood and cut a 1 and 7 16 inch hole in it and put it back on and thread it. Uh, Monty, the other answer to that question is usually after I've got the box in that spot, I've already parted it off. So it's not, but I, there's um, no reason you couldn't use it that way and, the, and you'd have your jam chuck built. But I've kind of done this to. Um, This one, uh, when I'm done and I get home, I park this off, I finish the box, I'll make a new lid because I, I want to do some sanding in that. So I, the lid is going to be expendable anyway. But I do the same thing and cut threads in this. And this is. This is soft. It's either cherry or soft maple. But for the purpose of making a jam chuck, it'll take threads well enough because all you really got to do is hold it and not worry about how pretty it is. 
and then I'll uh, show you the modifications I've done. But this is the same drill. We're cutting a female thread this time so you don't have to worry about the cutter trying to spin the thing off. People say that if you've got a wood that is not taking threads very well, you can spritz, spritz it with kerosene. Somebody else told me you can take and um, brush on a solution of Dawn soap and mineral oil, and it will cut better threads. I, I don't know if they will or not. But essentially, I cut threads in this box until it fits. And it fits. Don't worry about it. And then I take it to a bandsaw and I cut four slots in it, or two slots, through the, through the bandsaw. Turn it 90 degrees, do it again, right to the bottom of the hole. And then put this in it, right? And then cinch the hose clamp down and put it in. Um, I'll pass this around. This is the quality of threads that's in that wood. That's all you need to hold that for a jam chuck. But I got kind of tired of building jam chucks and cutting one off and then having to build the same one again. So I started using a material called Delrin. It's a plastic that DuPont makes. And um, it's non-brittle, it's, it's uh, very machinable. And uh, that's what it was designed for. So it takes the reds really well. And when I make one that's got a one and seven sixteenths inch hole in it, I keep it and I've got that for one and seven sixteenths and as I need them I just keep building them so here's one that I've built out of this Delrin and it's on a smaller face plate so I've got to put an adapter on it I didn't hear you. Does the Delrin bounce or break when it hits a hard surface if you drop it? Uh, it does not break. It's not brittle at all. Cool. Um, D-E-L-R-I-N. Um, Plasticare, is that the name of it? Down uh, in Denver sells it. They're off at about Orchard and, or Oxford and Santa Fe. Um, Granger has it in their catalog. It comes in flat stock and it comes in round pieces. Um, here's one you can pass around a little bigger. Uh, from quarter inch to probably 12 inch diameter. And um, it just is a dream to turn. One thing about the Delaware, you can turn it, it's a little aggressive and it catches that um, yeah, you got to kind of, you turned it before? Um, I haven't had much trouble with it, but I, uh, I've taken my time with it, so I only go in a couple threads, and uh, I haven't had bad experiences with it. it. It streams off once you get it round, and then it gets, you got to, 
fight it like the acrylic and pull the pieces off. I mean, it's just awful to uh, keep clean. But this is the same concept as the wooden one, and I just put it in. And you can see if you've got to see how where that Japanese saw. But once you once I've got these um, jam chucks built, you know I don't have to do anymore. So I've I've got about probably twelve or fifteen of them made for various sizes. I've made, um, I don't know, probably 75 or 80 elk antler boxes, but not all of them have been threaded. So uh, hopefully the, the days of spending time building the jam chucks is going to be behind me. Do I need to warn anybody about this? <laughs> you don't want to put your fingers on that side because it's just going to smell. And it does it pretty fast. <laughs> it was 1853, well, it does it 853 times a minute. So the longest you should leave your finger in there if it hits is like a half a minute. <laughs> oh, yeah, I, don't, I don't even like to think about that. That bounces out. Yeah. I've got a little bit of a spiral in there. I want to take that out. Um, but once you get this cleaned up, sanded, put a couple details in it. You know, if you want to, um, Kip Christensen told me that we were talking about details in class I took from him. And he, he says that the detail is something you put in a piece of wood that you can't see from 10 feet away. I guess that's a, all right. So um, this could be the top of the box and just a knob put in here. Or I could do like that one that's going around, put another piece on it that's a little bigger diameter that will rest on top of the box so the smart Alex can't turn the lid on and put it on upside down. Well, and you just put a handle on both sides. <laughs> well, I could do that too. But then you can't, the diamonds you buy for your wife have to be really tiny in order to fit in that box. What kind of cheapskate are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I didn't know that the guys in the club were doing that until one of my friends ratted them out and they said they were doing that. Uh, I did put a big nick in that um, uh, thread, so that's going to be wasted. But I've got a, another piece of Corian I've turned with a bit on it, and I just take that. I'll put it right here. Let me see what and just put a teeny piece of, piece of CA glue on it. A word about the CA glue, and we'll talk a little bit about lubrication. Um, if you talk to Kurt Theobald, the first question out of his mouth is, what is the encarvial rating of the glue? And I look at Kurt, and I go, Kurt. I'm an engineer, you're a farmer. Help me with what the hell you're saying. <laughs> and he says, Rick, if you want your pieces in museums, I don't, I don't think I'm going to have my pieces in museums. But the point is, is, CA glue will fail over time, evidently. I have not had any of these fail. But he, he's cautioned me about using other glue, um, T88. But the, the two-part epoxies, 
are, are just more of a pain in the neck to deal with than, than CA glue. So if the first one comes back that is separated because of not bouncing it on the floor but because of the glue joint and it comes back before I die, then I'm going to start worrying about the glue joints. Otherwise, I'm not going to worry. <laughs> so that lid is on there. And then it, fortunately, that ding in there didn't stop it from going on. And that thread's on there. Lubrication-wise, um, I learned more and more and more about this, as you should. Uh, first of all, the elk antler can move. Um, so if you've got a piece and it, it weighs down the road, the lid doesn't fit anymore, it may be lubrication, it may be because the elk antler has moved. So keep that in mind. The lubrication, what, what I've been using is a five to one blend of mineral, mineral oil to beeswax. And it's one that Kip Christensen gave. And you've got to heat the mineral oil, just weigh, you know, up mineral oil and then find the weight of that and cut one fifth of that weight in beeswax, put it in, and you've got to heat it up. And that beeswax will just stay there, stay there, stay there, stay there until you hit that magic temperature and then it just goes boom. And when you cool it back down, it stays homogeneous. And it, it's more like the texture of um, maybe neutral shoe polish. And I just put a little bit of it on the thread and work it on liberal with it. And then working on it, I mean, it's night and day. You, that rough part that we had when we first started fitting it uh, is gone. And then I just take the excess with a paper towel and um, wipe it off. And the same with this. Now I'm going to finish this box. I'm going to build a new lid and finish the bottom. I don't want to take it out of the chuck. But unless you were going to build a second part on top of that lid that fits down, uh, that's all I would do. I would also put a little button of some sort to cover that hole on the bottom. Another piece of Corian maybe contrasting. Um, when you put these together, you, you want to... My, where you can see... you. You want to put that on until it stops and then back it off. Just a, you know, five minutes. Does that make sense on the face of a clock? Um, and leave it there and, and don't tighten it. Um, the box on the rack there that has no bark on it, it's got the red and blue Corian trim. Um, at the top of that, there's some discoloration now. I think you can see it, maybe a quarter of an inch around that, kind of an uneven ring. That elk antlers has absorbed that oil. And I didn't know it would do that either. So you, you've got to, with the elk antler anyway, re-lubricate um, it occasionally. I, I gave a box to a friend of mine about a year ago and he couldn't get the lid off it. It was on the shelf for a long time, and he was showing somebody, and he showed this box, and then he couldn't get the lid off. He had to take a pliers and some leather around that knob and break that and then lubricate it again, and it's fine. But I don't know if the elk antlers pulling that out um, what is going on, whether the, uh, the, the oil in that is just drying it, but I'm, I'm learning more about the lubrication of them as well. So there's a little bit to do them, but don't tighten them. Uh, that's a thin box so that um, oil does seem to uh, show up more than the, than the thicker walled ones, but um, just 
you know, kind of play with it, but don't put them on tight. And it, again, if you uh, if you lubricate them once in a while, you could probably use um, neutral shoe polish. You might try Renaissance wax, um, a number of waxes. Yeah. When you buy your antlers, how do you know if you're going to have a good antler or a good Well, I buy my antlers already cut, so I can see them. Uh, but if you don't, if, if it's a solid antler, um, you have no idea. And uh, that, that's a gamble. The problem with that is, is uh, antler goes for um, 20 bucks a pound. And when you buy a whole side, um, th they can weigh 10 pounds on each side. So, uh, you know, you got $200 or more into that antler and you only want three pounds of it, the rest of it's going to be, it's not any good to me uh, because it's, when you get away from that main beam, the cross-sectional area of it gets to be more like an egg, so it, you, there's no place to cut threads in it, it's not round. And um, so I find uh, people that are selling them, not the Boy Scouts, but are selling pieces, and uh, they will cut them up and cull them for you. Uh, the big market, Clarence, still here? Yep. <laughs> We've had this discussion before. Um, one of the markets for elk antler is dog chews, and it's driven the price up. And uh, I just gave Clarence an article from uh, Public Radio that was on our website, and I laughed when I saw it because I immediately thought it, of him. And, and his background is. Uh, uh, yeah, and, and he said he's having people spend a lot of money on dogs' teeth after the dogs have been chewing elk antler. Yeah. So he loves it, well, oh, he yeah. doesn't. Um, so I, I would be careful, I'm not saying that's what you should feed your dog, but that's driven price of it. bought my last, last lathe, so. <laughs> yeah. You know, the elk antler's gone for four or five or six things. Um, it's, it, it, the, the big ones, you know, that somebody shot, they, they want to put them in their hall and say, I shot that. Um, and some of those people legitimately shot those elk and probably braved some tough times to do that. Other people will buy those matched pieces and take them to a taxidermist and then maybe fib a little bit, kind of like Mom does with the fishing catches. <laughs> <laughs> and then they make chandeliers out of them. Um, they make stuff like this. There's a small market for boxes and knife handles and belt buckles and pens. And uh, then a lot of them are dog shoes and a lot of them are shipped to the Pacific Rim. And they, they're ground up and used as a, a part of an aphrodisiac. Um, you want to come into my shop and smell that shop after I've been turning milk in for a while. Boy, well, good luck on that aphrodisiac. <laughs> that stuff is nasty. It, it just smells. How's it work? <laughs> Remember I gave you that 30 pounds of it? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I, the smell is so bad. You know, they, um, I don't know. Have you ever uh, used the buttons? On anything. Um, the, the, the button, um, I've got a, quite a few buttons. Uh, they've, uh, a couple of my friends, have, three people I know have made boxes out of them. And they make just sensational boxes. But they're a different shape. They're like a, a, a small dish. Uh, Kip Christensen has got one that there's photos of all over. And it's not for sale. Pete Holt has, uh, has done one. I've got one of Pete's and uh, Grove, um, Grove Brown and the Denver Club does it. And uh, uh, he did one for me. I traded him some elk antler for a finished box. And uh, they are spectacular. I have not done those yet, but that's kind of on the list. Well, if you've got a special part of the antler and the antler's 15 bucks a pound, what does a special part cost? That's cut and everything. Um, 
Well, you start to ask really personal questions. <laughs> this guy that I buy from, uh, he doesn't care. He, call, he cuts them all up and sells them as dog shoes. It doesn't matter the color they are, the size they are, or anything else. So I've worked with him and I've made him a couple boxes and he cuts those pieces off for me and puts them in a box. I go up there, look through them, take this much, we weigh them, I pay, I, I tell my wife, go run and get us a cup of coffee. Um, I think I'm paying him 18 bucks a pound for him, but about, about not much more than the going price, but they're good pieces and I'm willing to pay a little bit more. Yeah. I just read an article starting this year, the state of Colorado is requiring a license to, to go after sheds. Really? Yes. Interesting. And, and depending on what side of the uh, I-70 you're on, there's also a season for finding the sheds. But it's a $40 license to go out and look for antlers. It, it, that's a, it's a real um, competitive market picking up those antlers. I, I, I didn't realize uh, how competitive it is to get those things. Well, that's yeah, I, a word of caution. You can pick them up in National Forest. You cannot pick them up in National Park or the Elk Refuge north of Jackson. Please. I think I comment or two here. First of all, uh, the guy that invented this is a good friend of mine, and his name is Willard uh, Baxter. He was a pastor of the Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, he and I were elected to the national board, AEW, back in 2000. And uh, uh, so I got to know him, but uh, I uh, yeah, noticed that. I've got one machine just like that. I've got one of the first ones he had before he passed on. We lost him in 2004 to cancer, and uh, he was a very, very good friend, and we kept in touch. And uh, uh, I know most of us don't have the kind of money that uh, Rick has. And so <laughs> he does uh, he us how many pieces we've got. Mine is a small one. I paid about 200 Fifty dollars. He may give me a little break. I don't remember. But I bought one of the last ones he had before he died. He ran a little shop uh, as well in Atlanta, selling uh, tools and uh, accessories and so on. But uh, this has turned a whole new uh, life for me because I have I've turned it for kids. And uh, of course, Kip has been a very close friend. He came and got his doctor here. And, uh, 1991 was uh, for a year, but he hadn't quite got into the uh, elk deal there. But I have mine and my mounts on a uh, mini lathe, and uh, as far as I'm concerned, you can do the same thing on a mini lathe, oh. and a lot less. You brought about 10 minutes. I know your machine there will cost a lot less than that one right there. I've got the same thing here, but uh, it, uh, I'm really impressed. Um, I'll get the information to someone, and we'll get it on, on the website. If you if you Google Baxter threading jig, you'll get there. But um, I'll, I'll get the information to you, and, and it's all there. And, uh, I, I can't, it, it's a big, heavy, well-built, expensive piece of equipment, but, but it is it is a good piece of equipment, but... Um, Mine is half that size, and yeah. it works good. I use it on the uh, Delta video. I've got, I got to tell you a story about uh, Lee. Oh. <laughs> Six or seven or eight or nine years ago, probably eight or nine years ago, Billings, Montana had its first 
wood turning symposium, and it's a hands-on symposium. And uh, so Pete Holtus and Lee were the first two guys that, that went up there to do that. And my brother belonged to the club, and that's where I'm from. So I volunteered to go with Pete and Lee to go up to that symposium. And uh, so I got to spend um, four days with Lee and Pete, and a couple of long days in the in the truck driving across Wyoming and discussing things, and got to know him fairly well, and um, got to laugh at a lot of stories. But we had a good time up there, and uh, uh, he's they still ask about him, Lee and uh, Lee and Pete, my brother, who hosted them one evening for some cocktails. Um, both got some turned pieces from Lee and Pete, so they're. I don't give my brother anything I turned out like. <laughs> they're still asking me for pieces. So, any other questions? If you've got questions, um, get a hold of me. When you uh, were doing the lid, when you, you made your Corian chuck, yeah. you just glued that on there with the CA glue? Yep. And, you know, I, I, I just try to smooth them up and get them straight, you know, perpendicular to the way of bed, you know, and sand it quickly to 180 and do the same thing on the other people, the other piece and uh, put the CA glue in and rub them together so it's spread evenly and, and, and just pinch them a little bit. You don't need much pressure on them. Um, and, and I typically, anything I glue, I leave 24 hours before I turn it. I, I try to think far enough ahead. Um, Especially if it's not between centers, you know. I'm, but it's just crazy not to be able to do it. You know. I haven't had the problem that Kurt is warning me about. That sooner or later the C acre is going to fail. We'll see. Like I said, uh, Smithsonian has not contacted me yet. Yep. There's a tenon on it. You know, maybe an eighth of an inch tenon, and. Um, just pop it up in there. And the same thing, uh, you, you, you cut it, the bottom of it, the top of it, get the can on it, fit the box, part it off, turn it around, put it in a jam chuck, and, and do the same thing. But I really wanted to spend more time on cutting the threads and make sure that process was good before you worry about the other, the other things. Can, can you get power feed for that? That <laughs> seemed to be kind of, you know, a lot of. Yeah, but I have, I'm going to look into that. Okay. But it's hard, it's hard to find a switch that just turns on and off three threads. Yeah. Okay. Reverse those two. Yeah. Well, thank you for uh, giving me your time.